Within Greek mythology, there is a tragic figure named Cassandra, not our Cassandra, this is a different one. She's gifted the ability to predict the future, but then she's also cursed with the fact that nobody will listen to her. So she goes on and she warns Paris, don't go over to Sparta, and if you do, definitely don't bring Helen back to Troy. But then she's laughed at, and Paris goes to Troy, and he brings back Helen, and then a war starts. As the war comes to the end, she tries to warn the citizens, hey, there's a trap in that horse, let me light it on fire. And everyone disbelieves her, and they restrain her, they don't let her bring a torch to it, and so then she's stuck just watching the city get sacked. It's a hopeless and perhaps lost cause for her to try to warn people of the impending disaster, but still, she keeps on trying. I think this has become a common trope that endures throughout life and our stories because even without the ability to actually literally see the future, we've all experienced to one degree or another the utter frustration of knowing what somebody should or shouldn't do and trying to warn them, and then they don't listen to us and they do the thing and we're just stuck watching the disaster play out. As the adage says, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. But those who do know history are doomed to watch as everyone else repeats it. It's a situation that God's prophets know very, very well. Yes, sometimes people actually do heed the warning and disaster is averted, but more often than not, they go unheard and disregarded. So last week I talked about Jeremiah and his prophecy against the people of Jerusalem, how they were commanded by God to mend their ways and return to his law and start acting like the holy people they were set out to be, witnesses of the creator of heaven and earth to all of the surrounding nations as he taught them to, or the consequences would be dire. And the people heard the message and they promptly ignored it. As a result, the predictions that were given to Jeremiah came true and about 20 years after he gave that prophecy, Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians and its people were taken into exile. Told you so. Now among the first group of people that are taken out of the city and forcibly relocated is the priest Ezekiel, who God then calls to be his prophet to the Judeans in exile, as well as sending word back to those who are still in Jerusalem waiting to be exported. It's not a very attractive calling because even as God is commissioning Ezekiel to go forth and bring his word to the nation, God warns him, the house of Israel will not be willing to listen to you for they are not willing to listen to me because all the house of Israel have a hard forehead and a stubborn heart. So now he has the unenviable position of having to go forth and proclaim heavenly truths as revealed to him by the Lord Almighty, bearing warnings against the actions of Israel, letting them know what they should do instead of what they're doing if they want to ever find hope or prosperity again, and the whole time knowing he will be ignored and ridiculed and disregarded. So for the first 25 or so chapters, the book of Ezekiel has him proclaiming judgments against Israel. He lets them know why God has had them exiled, why the exile continues, and what further destruction and hardship they should expect if they don't change their way, and so on. He actually goes further than just proclaiming God's warnings to them, though. Ezekiel is told to actually act them out. And so God tells him to do things like make a model of Jerusalem and then lie on your side and glare at it for over a year. I think it's 430 days he's supposed to glare at it to symbolize how God is glaring judgment upon the people. He's told to go out and very publicly so everyone can see him bake his bread over a burning pile of dung to symbolize the terrible food that Israel is going to have to eat throughout their exile. It's Not a very uplifting book through all of this section. And maybe you can't necessarily blame the people for thinking Ezekiel is a crazy person and not listening to the things he's saying. At the same time, though, they're actually living out this judgment that was proclaimed against them. And so it does make it a little bit harder for them to say this message from God has no bearing on their lives. So now, as we get to today's Old Testament reading, God is repeating the call he has given to Ezekiel. He is to be a watchman over Israel, delivering God's warnings to those who need to hear it. 
Even if the people don't listen to him, he is called to warn them to turn away from their wickedness and to repent, to return to God's ways. If Ezekiel doesn't call out the harmful behaviors, even if they don't listen to them, he will be held responsible for the consequences the people suffer. But if he does pass on the warnings, then when the people disregard him, at least he will not be held liable for what befalls them. And so his thankless job as prophet and priest continues. However, by the time we get to today's reading, it seems that maybe the people are finally willing to listen to him because they admit in the next verse that their transgressions and sin are upon them. The threat of God's judgment is much more salient for them now that they're recognizing they're in the middle of it, that this exile is the result of their sins. The suffering they face at the hands of the Babylonians is the means by which God is bringing judgment to bear against them. And so the people cry out, how then can we live? But unfortunately, they don't quite get it yet. They lament that they will rot away to nothingness on their current trajectory, but they don't recognize what, what's really at play here. As we learn further down in the reading, they actually think God is being unjust, that the punishment they're enduring doesn't fit the crime. Just as Jerusalem thought no harm could befall them because of the good luck charm of the temple, like we talked about last week, the people now are thinking that the good deeds of their past should have insulated them from the destruction they're facing now. You know, okay, maybe we deserved a slap on the wrist for a couple of mistakes we made along the way, but we were mostly good. That should count as something, right? You're, this, is, this is just excessive, God. But that's not how it works. Good deeds aren't an insurance policy that makes the bad ones not matter. You don't get to just buy an indulgence on your way to the brothel and then not be held accountable for what you do in there. Or as God says here, if he trusts in his righteousness and does injustice, none of his righteous deeds shall be remembered, but in his injustice that he has done, he shall die. The fact that Israel followed God in the days of David's reign doesn't mean that he would overlook all of their abominations of idol worship and violence and greed, extortion and adultery for the rest of time. They deserve this exile. And they deserve it when immediately after today's reading, they find out that Jerusalem has fallen and that they're now left without a homeland to return to. When they've moved beyond just a people in exile to the last remnant of Israel, they deserve it. So will they finally heed this lesson and amend their ways or will they continue to do wickedness towards their own destruction? If I'm being honest, it's a bit surreal to be writing a sermon on Ezekiel in the midst of the chaos of the world today. Reading about the fall of Jerusalem and all the hardships that Israel faced in exile while dealing with our rampant inflation, increasingly polarized governments, and the warning that the Ukraine situation will collapse the petrodollar and completely destroy our economy starts to sound a little close to home. Honestly, I don't understand that petrodollar part, but it does have me worried. Part of me wants to insist that America can't fall. We're the leader of the free world. We've been for too long. We've been the spearhead of innovation through our free markets. We're a beacon of democracy and all of those other wonderful patriotic things we hear about as we grow up in grade school. We can't fall. We've done too much good. Part of me also remembers how often the church has to be like Jeremiah and Ezekiel to our country. After all, we have the clear word of God instructing us on his laws and the ways things ought to run, and oftentimes we blatantly warn society they're going the wrong way. We may not have actual prophetic visions from God, but we know enough to see how certain behaviors lead to destruction. But when we raise our voices and try to warn the world that they're going astray, we're accused of just being reactionaries, and we're committing a slippery slope fallacy that keeps coming true anyway. When we cry out that the rule of law matters, that family and a proper understanding of what marriage is matters, that church attendance matters, and that society crumbles without these things, we're told that we need to get with the times and stop with that backwards thinking. When we say that human sacrifice is wrong and Gnosticism is a heresy, we're told that we need to just live and let live. When we point out the simple truth that nobody comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ, we are pushed aside and told that all paths lead to salvation. Nothing truly evil will come about from a cultural shift away from God's word. 
Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that all of the hardships that of the last three years are directly punishment from God for America's sins. As, ever, as with every evil of the world, it very well could be God's judgment on us, or it could just be sin's corruption once again rearing its ugly head on a fallen world until God gives me a prophetic vision and lets me know I can't say either way. But what I can say is if this is God's judgment against us, it is just, it's right, and we deserve it. We don't want to hear this, and I know this will upset people, but America deserves to fall as does Ukraine and Russia and China and Norway and Uzbekistan. Every nation has done something wrong to one degree or another and deserves God's judgment against it. In the same way, every individual has sinned in some way or another and deserves God's wrath. As I said last week, and as Ezekiel says to the people now, you don't get to make the claim that you've been generally good, at least better than those guys, and so you don't have to have anything bad happen to befall you. You deserve good things because you're better than them. All have sinned. All have fallen short. All of it is deadly serious. Jesus says in our gospel reading today, those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed, do you think they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. If the fig tree doesn't bear fruit, cut it down. If you trust in your own good works to offset the bad, to claim that you deserve nice things, that you can merit your own heavenly reward, or that all it takes is one wrong deed to undo all of that. And everyone here has done at least one wrong deed. As a nation and as individuals, we deserve the same destruction that was set upon Jerusalem. But the good news is that this chapter 33 ends up being a turning point in Ezekiel's book. As the people are finally brought low and start to recognize the severity of the sin, as the reality of God's judgment becomes concrete for them in the news that Jerusalem has fallen, the message shifts from judgment to mercy and consolation. And we already start to see that shift in today's reading. Yes, they are condemned for their sin. They are told that they deserve the judgment they have received. They are reminded that the good deeds of their past can't overcome the evils of the presence. But the comparison between righteousness and wickedness goes both ways. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall by it when he turns from his wickedness. When the wicked turns from his wickedness and does what is just and right, he shall live by this. While God is just in his judgments against humanity's sins, it turns out that there is an injustice in place, but it's an injustice in our favor. While a righteous past can't overcome a sinful present, a righteous present does overpower a sinful past. Even now, as Israel is in the heart of condemnation, the offer is made to return to God and receive his mercy. As we read in today's gospel reading, even after three years of fruitlessness, the vine dresser is still willing to give special attention to that fig tree in order to restore it in the master's sight. The beauty of grace is that it makes life not fair. This applies to us today as well. So while we may find ourselves in the unenviable position of Ezekiel, trying to warn the world of its folly, calling people back to repentance while suffering the, the judgment that sin draws upon us, we also have the privilege of knowing the injustice of forgiveness. So while we struggle through this life and the uncertainty of the times in which we live, we have the privilege of the revelation of God's mercy, the knowledge that through Christ's work on the cross, we are not lost forever that through our repentance we are returned to God one way or another. So I don't know what's going to happen in the future geopolitically. I would wager that the church will continue to be condemned in the world, but I don't know if America will fall or not. I, I hope it doesn't. But it is possible, and like I said, deserved. 
But greater than the death that all of our sins has earned is the merciful nature of a God who tells Ezekiel, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. And so our assurance throughout whatever befalls us in this life must always be the faithfulness of God who declares us righteous through the work of Jesus. And if we have been so declared righteous, if we remain God's chosen people through our adoption in Christ, then surely we will live, though all the rest of the world should pass away. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until the life everlasting. Amen.